Hello, hello, and welcome to Games Revisited. I am your host, Anon Jr. We are continuing along in our interludes series, a uh, little bit of the Games of My Youth vibe that we've got going. And this week is the SNES edition, so we've been going through some different games. The first section that we did on the live stream that you probably saw come out a couple days ago, that was all about little time wasters, Super Mario World, uh, Mega Man X, that sort of thing. And, uh, <laughs> hello again. And the second segment, we did some of the fighter games. We did Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, and we jam-packed a, a bunch of different games into each segment along a general theme. For the next four, I want to, I want to pace it out a little bit better because these are games that deserve a, a good 20-minute run to themselves. Um... Just by the volume of time wasters and fighting games, you kind of get the impression that that's most of what I did. And, and, well, okay, so Doom and Wolfenstein, yeah, pretty pretty much closer. And Commander Keen and some of the other PC games that uh, that we haven't done on a series like this. Um, there, there was definitely a lot of those. But since we're focusing on the SNES, there were a number of adventure games that I played too. We're going to look at four of them. Uh, one of the really big ones is Chrono Trigger, so big that it is going to be season two. So we will be going through Chrono Trigger from start to finish all the way through all 60, 60, 80 hours of gameplay that went into that one. And we're going to take a quick look at the beginnings, like the first 20 minutes or so of four of my other favorites. So if any of these ring a bell and you got ideas for season three, then, um, uh, then, you know, kind of keep tabs on these. There, there, Crystallis was uh, another game along these lines that was for the original Nintendo. I, I did a really quick introduction to that, and I feel kind of bad about how quick that introduction was. So uh, I might go back at a later date and give that a, a better go around because Crystallis was in the running with Chrono Trigger for Season 2. So... Enough of that. Let's get to what we're here for. And of course, it's not on the quick list because Retro Arch hates me. So let me go to load content. C. Users. Head on down to the Dropbox and load up. Now, I'm going to go through these in the order they were published, which is a little bit different than the order I bought them in. So, so I do want to make that, that distinction. I want to go through them in the order they were published just because it, it'll help give you a better sense of the progression of graphics and progression of gameplay and how different things were done. So keep that in mind as we go along. So we're actually going to go play Ultima 6, The False Prophet. This was my first introduction to the Ultima franchise. I never played an Ultima game before this. No. I take that back. I played one of the ones that was on the Nintendo, but I didn't know what Ultima was or that it was a franchise. I just knew that, you know, something, something Ultima. Okay, cool. And this was the first that, that I actually kind of started doing a little bit more research into, which was very limited because we're talking 1990, 1993. The Ultima 6 originally started out as a PC game in 1990, and then in 93, it was ported to the Super Nintendo. Um, oh, okay, there we go. Uh, R. <laughs> yes, boys and girls, there were no keyboards to type your stuff in on the console games. All right, let's get the messages a little bit faster, shall we? Now, apparently, in um, because of the limitations of the SNES versus the computers, even in the early 90s, uh, some sacrifices were made to the gameplay. Like, uh, in the PC version of the game, you actually had a character creation phase where you'd pick virtues, which would give you pluses and minuses to strength and magic and speed and all sorts of other stuff like that. Whereas on the SNES edition, you didn't have that. So when I played this game, I didn't know that there was a character creation option. It was just, you know, you got the character you got. And 
Um, also, Nintendo America had some interesting, um, interesting views that that differentiated itself from the main Nintendo based in Japan. And Nintendo America would make some changes to the games as they came to the states. Uh, so, in the Nintendo America release of Ultima Six, there were no dead bodies left on the ground. There was no gore. Uh, certain spells were renamed, certain aspects of the game were, were changed, and, and all to, to keep in accordance with the, uh, with the rules that Nintendo America had for itself in that time frame. Um, so now we're about to get to the gate. Uh, it catches you up a little bit on what happened between Ultima 5 and now, you know, the idea is that you are being transported via a moon gate from the real world into the world of Ultima. Um, Lord British in the game is an actual person that is the avatar of uh, the main principal writer who I have actually met at Dragon Con. Um, well, met as in I was in the same room as him, so don't don't read more into that than, than anything else. Uh, but still, it's fun. And yeah, that's right. Ultima 6 is where they introduced the red moon gates and some other stuff. <laughs> but wait, your joy gives way to apprehension. Time to start time to move away from uh from the the technical talk and into <laughs> into the uh the game. Because this is getting ready to set up the story, so you're going through a red moon gate instead of a blue moon gate, which is starting a little, war a little weird, and now you're going to find out why. A twisting feeling overcomes you, and you faint. You hear a noise like a beast screaming in the distance. These are supposed to be gargoyles. Now remember, high-end graphics at this time is 1024 by 1024. <laughs> Remember, you're running this game on DOS. Windows 95 is, is, isn't even a twinkle in Bill Gates' eye. All right, so we're, we're still talking MS-DOS, uh, really low-end graphics. And even then, it had to be simplified down a little bit further to, to make it onto the limited space and memory of the SNES. And, and again, you'll, you'll notice these uh, gargoyles or gargoyle-like creatures um, in the actual PC game and in the SNES port that went everywhere outside of America, uh, these guys actually had horns too, which Nintendo America did that to, uh, to, uh, comply with certain rules for publish in America. The horns made it look too devil-like. And I, I agree with that because these are supposed to be gargoyles. I, I don't know what lore makes gargoyles red um, and demon looking, but okay. I mean, they have been known to uh, punch a character out, but you know, that, that's another story for another time. <laughs> so they give you, you know... Being an adventure game, they give you a big, long story, lots of stuff going on. You're about to get stabbed to death. 8-bit audio hits you, surprise finds you, you're still alive because of course you are. You just started the game. <laughs> and you behold a wondrous sight. It's your old friends from Ultima V, Shamino. Art thou all right? Yes. Lord British uh, wrote the game with the King James English in mind. So th there are a lot of turns of phrases that you find a little bit more in the Shakespearean English than, uh, than you do modern English, and that is important to remember as you play the game. Um, so you get your three main guys, and this is where, uh, in doing the research to, to play this game in... Uh, to do the research to play this game in uh, it, for games revisited, I found out a very frustrating thing. Okay. Um. All right. 
Uh, let's go ahead and auto our way through this. Uh, other than this fight right here, you could actually complete the game without fighting. Uh, Ultima, as a franchise, was very focused on the concept of virtues. You had a karma system, you had a virtue system. And it would affect the way people interacted with you. It would affect your options. Like, if you stole stuff, it would change the way, you know. Should sound familiar to all you Skyrim players. <laughs> So a lot of a lot of that sort of stuff had its roots here in the Ultima gaming system, uh, in the Ultima game environment, and, and I, I kind of I, I think that's why certain parts of Skyrim really resonated with me because it reminded I, I don't I don't think I ever drew that connection until right now that we're talking we're we're talking the the. Uh, the, the hits of nostalgia. And I really wish this gargoyle would hurry up and die so that way we'd get back to uh, talking about the game system and other good thing. Garfolk is defeated. Shimino gets 19 points of experience. And there's much rejoicing. Yay. <laughs> so you start off with this party of four. Yourself and your three friends from the previous Ultima game. In the SNES version... Can, where's the menu key? Okay. Yes, camp attack, look, talk, inventory. There we go. Okay. Um, there we go. So you got yourself and your four companions, and in the SNES port, you could only pick up two more companions. In the PC game, you could pick up four more companions. You know, gee, if only I could have two more people fighting stuff, killing things and breaking stuff. Um, kind of wish I had downloaded the... Uh, Book though, so I could, uh, all right, let's do this. Let's go talk. There we go. The King of Britannia, Lord British, tis good to see thee again. Much hath happened since thou last departed our realm. Here is the key to my castle. Use the key to leave the castle. Now, let me tell thee what has transpired since thy last visit. I came back to this castle thanks to your rescue. There was a big earthquake and the underworld collapsed. All was quiet for a time, but I fear we can no longer live in peace. Britannia is under attack by gargoyles such as those thou just fought. Yeah, they slipped up on the British, on the uh, Shakespearean English in a few spots. They tried though. They are clever creatures with a fierce appearance. They have been coming up through the dungeons. Thus far, they have committed most of their attacks on the shrines of the eight virtues. When the Shrines of Compassion didst fall, Sir Geoffrey sent a party to free it. Dost thou ask him of this mission? We must recover the Shrines by using the Eight Runes. Thus far, fighting against the Gargoyles hast proven fruitless. I hope that thee canst save us once more. Whilst thou art here, I have a room in the castle set aside for thy personal use. Tis in the west wing of the castle, just south of my known chambers. There is some equipment in case thou should have need of it. Of course, thou mayst feel free to borrow anything in my castle if thou shouldst be in need. Lastly, any time thou dost need healing or to repeat all this later, thou but need ask me. And we get branching. <laughs> Yay, go, go, gadget, branching, constructions, uh, conversations, and virtue systems, and, and a great many things that... that um, have been around in gaming forever. Repeat name, job, gargoyle. And the more you talk to people, the more keywords would appear in here. And that's how you got your expanded conversations. And this, this is one of the games that I actually, I, I had a literal notebook where I'd keep notes of stuff because guess what there isn't yet? There isn't a quest log. 
Of course there isn't a quest log. They couldn't fit the whole game in here yet. <laughs> so you think they're going to give you a quest log? No, come on. All right. Um, which button was canceled? Buy me fortune favor thee. Now the nice thing is, is that you were at least given a full run of the castle, so you can do things like um, find the key. Can you take it? Yes, because guess what? If you stole the key, uh, your karma goes down. You you aren't able to meditate at the shrine and level up, and all sorts of stuff like that. Wrong button. Look. Herbert's Harry the Adventure, written and illustrated by Bill Pete. Okay. The door is locked. That's right. And you had to do all sorts of fun stuff like uh, find the leather boot. Yes. Yellow potion? Yes. Um, one of the things that I'm glad that got um, left behind <laughs> is uh, when you did your spells in Ultima, you actually had to have the reagents for the spell. So so think of all the, the potions and stuff that you do in, uh, in, in something like Skyrim or that sort of game now. And consider that here, in this game, you actually had to go find garlic. And you had to go find... Um, Oh, torches, always good. Yeah, sulfur ash. So if you wanted to cast the spell, you had to find enough sulfur ash to cast the spell. And spider silk. And nightshade. And mandrake. And ginseng. And garlic. And then you make your stew. Oh wait, no. Um, not, not for that. For the casting of spells. <laughs> and a leather boot, for some reason. So you had to keep track of not just, uh, let's see, let's go back to the inventory. So yeah, um, <laughs> funny how, uh, how slim that inventory looks, isn't it? You definitely had to make use of bags. You definitely had to make use of your minions. Because, uh, yeah. Please, let's, uh, <laughs> let's actually get equipped. Yeah, and man. This takes me back. Yeah, you, you definitely had to keep your uh, your notebook handy, your people handy, your food and drink handy. You unlike uh, unlike a lot of your the D and D stuff that you're more familiar with. Like uh, if you were watching through season one of Games Revisited, then you'll probably remember that you had six stats to keep track of, and here the game only gives you three: strength, dex, and intelligence. All your casting is based off of intelligence. Your defense and certain weapons are based off of dex, and your other weapons are based off, and carry capacity are based off of strength. Uh, dex will also affect your um, your land speed. So, things to keep in mind. Uh, move, drop, give. Oh yeah, that's right. He picked up the uh, gargoyle thing, didn't he? Nope. Oh, and I hit the wrong button again. Um, yes, I did that a lot then too, and more so now because I, I keep forgetting what's what. Look in the box. You find a scroll. 
Ooh, and an energy wand. And some gold. Gold is always good. No matter what the game, it spends well. <laughs> and yet, it, yes, to pick up anything, you had to do the look. Uh, it was easier on the PC edition. It Doing stuff like this definitely got... Uh, tedious on the console <laughs> look yes you see nothing special and that was the other thing you weren't always sure if there was something there or not Because the weirdest things would uh, would actually have something worth looking at. And yes, <laughs> as you can tell by the sound of the clock in the background and everybody running around, time mattered. So depending on when you looked and when you did things, you, you would actually have to catch people at the lunch table. You would have to actually catch people at work. Um, Nothing special. Look. I don't know. That looks like ribs over there. Ribs look special. I can't pick up the ribs. Alright. I can at least get cheese. Mmm. Butter. That definitely helps the uh, cholesterol stat, right? Oh, uh, and you get the idea. Y you would definitely want to run around the castle, pillage everything that was lootable, because Lord British gave you permission to, uh... <laughs> yeah, they gave you... Oh, yeah, sorry, I just noticed the comment that popped up. They gave you a quest log. Every game manual had a few pages at the back, lined and said, notes at the top. Yeah, except that quest log was not, uh, not nearly helpful enough. Alright. A tall, handsome man. I'm glad to see the Anon Jr., I sent a party of ten to recapture the Shrine of Compassion from the Gargoyles. Alas, they failed dismally. The survivors are recuperating in the town of Cove. Thou wouldst do well to speak with them first. Mayhap they learn something which might aid thee. I must confess I fear the worst. Good luck, and my thoughts are with thee. The Shrine of Compassion is east of this town. The village of Cove is further east than the Shrine. I am the captain of Lord Perdish's guard. I am Joffrey. Okay. And, and so you'd want to run around, talk to everybody, pick up anything that isn't bolted down, and even a few things that are, and uh, then go out into the world and make your way. And go a-questing and find out, oh yeah, you can't walk across that water because the game didn't know how to show you how deep it was. So... Water is not crossable. Sorry about that. That's life. You would have to find certain reagents at certain times. Like, uh, there, there were things that you could only find at night, so you needed to make sure that you uh, went there at night. And yes, you could fire the cannon if memory served. I just don't remember how to get there. Um, I missed the bridge, didn't I? <laughs> Alright. That's okay. Because I've given this the twenty minutes that uh that I wanted to give for this uh for this go round. I wanted to give a little bit look better look. You, you know, you see the uh Oh come on. Yeah, nobody wants to see somebody struggle with the gate <laughs> indoors. Alright. I want to look. The door is locked. Uh, inventory. Use Anon Jr. Use Key Bravo. Unlocked! Look, you see that? Uh... Hmm. Or 
closet on the side. Inventory. Use. So as you can tell, this part got a little tedious uh, very quick. Running around to the inventory to find the key to use on the door instead of it automatically happening. There we go. Look. Look at the lever. See lever. Pull lever. There we go. And out into the wide world you go with the fun background music and oh yeah, it's nighttime. Hmm. Some things you could find at night, I, I both like and dislike that they they decreased your vision. I mean, it makes sense. It's definitely in keeping with the D&D roots that this and other games like it were built upon. So let's go ahead and I know I picked up a torch somewhere. Right? Didn't I? There we go. Use torch. Torch is not readied. Why is torch not readied? Unready spell book. There we go. And on lights a torch. Late one for the adventures of the day. <laughs> and a lot of time was spent on this, and there was a lot of places you did not want to get caught without a torch, much like D&D. &D. You know, you wanted to talk to people, look at the signs, find the quest logs, investigate all the things. Uh, somewhere in the castle was a mouse, which is a little bit of a nod to earlier games in the series. Uh, you could eventually buy a boat and cram all your party into that boat that took up two squares. Because games. <laughs> oh man. Hours and hours. So again, if this is one of those things that you want to actually see a full-on run-through, uh, I wouldn't mind putting this in the running. Um, I might go find the PC edition somewhere, possibly on Steam or Grand Old Games, just because I, the PC controls are going to be slightly less tedious than the uh, the gamepad and the uh, console controls. All right, let's uh, let's close content. All right. And this is where I go and switch things over to the credits and say thank you for joining along on this episode of Games Revisited. If you're watching on YouTube, we're at the end. If you haven't already, do hit subscribe. That way you'll get notified when new videos go out. And uh, if you want to watch live, in other words, you want to see all six episodes live to tape, as it were, um, then use the links below to go to Twitch or Mixer, whichever one you prefer, and follow along there. You'll know when I go live. I've got my streaming schedule up in the channel descriptions. And, um, and thank you for joining along. Those of you who are watching live, stay tuned. I've got the next game on the list, a favorite that I... One that I absolutely know for sure is a favorite of one of the people in chat. And by the way... If you're watching after the fact on YouTube and you have questions, clips, quotes, quandaries, complaints, and other whatnot, please leave those in the comments. If you want a more real-time answer, then watch live, and then you can chat with me as we go along. So uh, with all that said and done, let me uh, close out for the YouTube folk and your streaming, streaming audience. Hang tight. <laughs>